right, everybody. Well, good evening to you. Let's, uh, what's that? Let's open our Bibles to the book of Galatians. Yeah, thank you, Janet, for doing that. Janet's got a handout for you. A paper handout, not a financial one. If you have a financial one, let me know, because I'll be first in line. Okay. Uh, Let's open our Bibles to the book of Galatians, chapter 1 and verse 4. And let me just sort of uh, recap just a little bit what we've been talking about in our series on the kingdom. I think this is lesson 76 or something. So sometimes the lessons are so long you might forget what we're talking about. (laughs) But we've been dealing with really the revival of an ancient heresy. If you look there at the map and look up north to the nation of Israel, you'll see a place called Antioch circled. I don't know if you can see that or not. And from Antioch came what we call the Kiliasts. You say, what does that mean? Well, it's the Greek word for thousand is Kilia. So those that believed in a future kingdom were called Kiliasts, and they came from Antioch. Uh, Today we would call them premillennialists. They didn't believe we were in the kingdom, but they felt that Jesus one day would come back and set up the kingdom. And that sentiment reigns in the church uh, for two centuries. And then down south, you'll see another circle there, a place called Alexandria, Egypt, and that's where developed a rival system. And these folks in Alexandria, Egypt, uh, North Africa really, began to argue, another center of thought. These were the two major centers of thought in early Christianity following the death of the apostles. But down in Alexandria, they began to argue that we are in the kingdom now. And they began to adopt a very allegorical method of interpretation. Whereas the folks up north in Antioch were very literal in their method of interpretation. And sadly, what happened beginning with, well, it was really the guy that sealed the deal was Augustine. I used to call him St. Augustine, but I don't, like to, I don't like to call him that anymore because I think the guy did a lot of damage. Augustine, coming from Alexandria, influenced by Alexandria, who, by the way, really didn't know Hebrew. He knew Greek, but he didn't know Hebrew. He, around the fourth century, wrote a book called The City of God, and he be, he he became, at that point, the most influential theologian in church history. If you want to know who the most influential theologian in church history is, it's by far Augustine. And here I'm not talking about the influence for good, I'm talking about the influence for bad. Because he took Kingdom Now theology and he codified it into a book called The City of God, written in the fourth century, and he convinced the entire church that the kingdom had started. And there's a lot of factors that went into that belief system, uh, one of which was the rise of a Roman emperor named Constantine. Constantine basically took the church, which had been persecuted by Rome, and he switched all of a sudden the policy and in the fourth century he, he made Christianity the official um, religion of the Roman Empire. So you have to understand that the Christians went from being heavily persecuted for 300 years roughly by Rome to all of a sudden they're elevated in Rome. And if that happened you would think the kingdom had come wouldn't you? And so Augustine writes his book around that general time period and he writes this book, The City of God, and he convinced the church that we are in the kingdom. We would call Augustine's book, The City of God, the first formal exposition 
of amillennialism or kingdom now theology or replacement theology in church history. And the moment that book became available is the moment the church went under the spell of Alexandria, Egypt. And the folks at Antioch, they became a minority opinion. So the story of church history is really how Alexandria eclipsed Antioch. And Alexandria eclipsed Antioch for a thousand years. And we really didn't start, a, we did, really didn't start crawling out from under that amillennial spell until after the Protestant Reformation. Because the Protestant reformers gave us the literal method of interpretation to rescue the church in certain areas, what we call the five solas. And it wasn't until after the Protestant Reformation that the church took the literal method of interpretation given by the reformers and they started to apply it to Bible prophecy. And as they did that, what happened is amillennialism became uh, less of an attractive view than premillennialism. And the mindset of Antioch uh, came back after being eclipsed by Alexandria for all of that period of time. So that's a, just kind of a quick overview you know, of church history and, and where we are. So Augustine writes this book, The City of God, Kingdom Now Theology, 4th century, and this really becomes the dominant opinion of the church all the way through the Middle Ages. This opinion was absorbed by the Protestant reformers, and it wasn't until latter generations after the Protestant reformers came and went that um, they began to correct this problem. One of the things that gave Augustine's book so much influence in church history, besides the elevation of Constantine, is the fact that the Jews were no longer in the land. So the Jews were thrown out of the land in which event? Anybody remember? A.D. 70. And that really, there was still some stragglers in the land of Israel as late as A.D. 135. And as long as the Jews were in the land with a functioning temple, you know, it's sort of hard to believe that all of Israel's promises had been canceled. But now um, the Jews are thrown out of the land, A.D. 70, a guy named uh, Hadrian comes to power and he names the land of Israel Palestine to mock the Jewish people. It was basically named after the ancient enemies of Israel, the Philistines. He was basically trying to de-Judaize the land, Hadrian was, and pretend like the Jews were never there. So with that being said, and the temple gone, and the nation of Israel kicked out, it seemed completely unrealistic to take the prophecies in the Old Testament of Israel's restoration literally, because the only thing over there was uh, a non-Jewish territory. So these are all factors that play a role into the ascendancy of Augustine's book, The City of God. No more Jews in the land, so we can't take those prophecies literally as those in Antioch had done. And uh, even beyond that, Constantine is now on the throne. And with Constantine on the throne, Rome is no longer persecuting Christianity, but promoting Christianity. And so it looked like the kingdom had come. So all of these factors play into Augustine's book and its, its influential effect on the church called the city of God. So Augustine in that book, the city of God wrote this, the saints reign with Christ during the same thousand years understood in the same way that is of the time of his first coming. And therefore the church even now is the kingdom of Christ and the kingdom of heaven Accordingly, even now, his saints reign with him. I mean, we've gone from being persecuted to being promoted in the Roman Empire. The kingdom must have come. We must be reigning now. 
And so he began to allegorize as those down in uh, Alexandria typically did with Bible prophecy. The folks in Antioch never allegorized, but those in Alexandria did. And so they, he developed this idea of amillennialism, replacement theology, kingdom now theology, and there's a lot of historical factors that gave rise to that belief system. And so that becomes the dominant view in the church all the way through the Middle Ages for over a thousand years, probably it wasn't even challenged by anybody in a real sense for about 1,200 years, 1,300 years, 1,400 years. Now, fortunately, the Protestant reformers in the 16th century gave us a literal method of interpretation. Some after the Protestant Reformation began taking the method of literal interpretation and applying it to Bible prophecy and chiliasm or premillennialism makes a comeback. But what is happening in our time is an ancient heresy is being brought back to life and that's kingdom now theology. The church, even in our time period, is now flirting with the idea of what Augustine originally espoused, and they're arguing that we are in the kingdom now. So some of these quotes I gave you in lesson one, 76 lessons ago, Um, (laughs) so they're probably not on the tip of your tongue, but I just wanted to remind you why we're doing this study, why I wrote this 400-page book on this subject it's to, it's to counter the church's apparent movement back to Augustine. So Doug Padgett of the Emergent Church, a modern writer, says the kingdom of God is a central conversation in emerging communities. And let me tell you that kingdom of God language is really big in the emergent church. So what is he doing? He's recycling Augustine. He's channeling Augustine. Brian McLaren, in his book, A Generous Orthodoxy, talks about how the purpose of Christ's ministry in his first coming was to establish a spiritual form of the kingdom on earth. That's what Augustine taught, coming out of Alexandria, Egypt. So Brian McLaren says of Jesus, he selected 12 and trained them in a new way of life. He sent them to teach everyone this new way of life. Even if only a few would practice this, many would benefit. Oppressed people would be free. Poor people would be liberated from poverty. Minorities would be treated with respect. Sinners would be loved and not resented. Industrialists, notice the kind of leftist slant here in all of this. This is why Kingdom Now Theology is very popular today because it's sort of a amorphous concept that people can read their own political ideology into, right or left. So you have people on the right saying we're in the kingdom, you have people on the left saying we're in the kingdom, because everybody's trying to use the Bible to sort of promote their own political view. Social justice mindset on the left, or dominionism, and things of that nature on the right. Industrialists, McLaren thinks capitalists are the enemies. Industrialists would realize that God cares for sparrows and wildflowers. So their industries should respect and not rape the environment. The homeless would be invited in for a hot meal. And then he gets to the punchline, the kingdom of God would come. That's what he thinks Jesus did in the first century. He ushered in this spiritual kingdom. Not everywhere at once, not suddenly, but gradually like seed growing in a field, like yeast spreading in a lump of bread dough. Now he's obviously not interpreting the yeast in Matthew 13 the way we've been interpreting it. We've been understanding the yeast as something negative, the growth of apostasy in the church age. He thinks the yeast is something positive like light spreading across the dawn. So this is basically the view of Kingdom Now theology that Jesus came into the world to give us this spiritual kingdom in his first coming. 
And as that kingdom grows, society is going to be altered or changed. And anything negative about society is going to disappear. Now, if I believe this, I think at some point I'd be very discouraged. Because to me, it doesn't look like the world's getting better and better. Amen? Things like things are deteriorating. But kingdom now theology is the exact opposite. McLaren elsewhere says, if Revelation were a blueprint of the distant future, it would have been unintelligible to its original readers. So don't teach the book of Revelation like they teach it at Sugarland Bible Church. It's not a futuristic prophecy. It's something that was fulfilled primarily in the first century. And obviously to believe that, you have to radically rewrite the book to make it fit. In light of this, Revelation becomes a powerful book about the kingdom of God here and now. See that? Available to all. That's a recycling of the ancient heresy taught by Augustine in his book, The City of God. Russell Moore, very leftist and very influential, president of the Ethics and Religious Liberties Commission of the Southern Baptist Convention. And I love the Southern Baptists, but I hope we all understand that the Southern Baptists in their convention are taking a major left-wing turn. And they're venturing into a social justice mindset. And obviously a big part of that is their promotion amongst some of their leaders that the kingdom is now. So the Southern Baptist Convention is, today is very different than the old days when Adrian Rogers and Charles Stanley and people like that were in positions of leadership. Paige Patterson, you now have a younger set of leaders and they're essentially going in a very leftist turn. And one of the things they're using uh, to promote this leftist turn, this younger generation of leaders, is Kingdom Now Theology. So Russell Moore, part of that movement, says the locus of the kingdom of God in this age is within the church, where Jesus rules as king. As we live our lives together, we see the transforming power of the gospel and the inbreaking of the future kingdom of God. Very common language uh, today. Rick Warren uh, makes the following statement. He says, I stand before you confidently right now and say to you that God, he's speaking to an audience, God is going to use you to change the world. I'm looking at a stadium full of people right now who are telling God they will do whatever it takes to establish God's kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. What will happen if the followers of Jesus say to him, we are yours? What kind of spiritual awakening will occur? So the kingdom, according to Rick Warren, is not something that God brings. We've taught in depth in this class that the kingdom, Daniel 2, and many other passages, is something that God himself brings to the earth at the end of the tribulation period. And what Rick Warren and all these other people are doing is they're shifting that responsibility of bringing in the kingdom onto the shoulders of the church. So with all of that being said, we're now moving into the final part of our study, chapters 22 through 26 of the book I wrote called The Coming Kingdom. And we're sort of at a transitional point in our study. By way of review, what we started off with in part one was what does the Bible, you know, B-I-B-L-E, that's the book for me, amen? What does the Bible teach about the kingdom? So we've taught that from Genesis to Revelation, right? And we've clearly seen that the kingdom is not canceled, but in a state of what? Postponement, yeah, very good. Number two, we took a look at what are the main problems with Kingdom Now interpretations? Well, the basic problem with it is they change what the Old Testament says. So to argue that we're in the Kingdom Now basically requires people to adopt a method of interpretation 
that the New Testament somehow changes the Old. And that's a problem because that would make God a what? A liar. Then we moved into number three. Why do some people teach that we're currently in the kingdom? I mean, they must have passages that they use. And there's an awful lot of them, aren't there? And we've started in Matthew, the first book of the Old Testament, uh, excuse me, New Testament, thank you, gone all the way through the book of Revelation, and we've looked at every single passage that Kingdom Now theologians use. And we've shown that none of the passages that, that, that they rely on teach what it is they think they teach. All of those passages can be understood in light of a futuristic kingdom. And now we're at a transitional part of the study because we're really no longer looking specifically at the biblical text. We're at number four here. And maybe I should have taught number four first after forcing you to endure 76 lessons. Who cares? I mean, why does it matter? If a church believes they're in the kingdom or ushering in the kingdom or building the kingdom or if you go to a conference called Kingdom Builders, what's the big deal? What's the harm in that? So what? We, we bring Augustine's belief from the 4th century back into the life of the church. So what? We put kingdom in our vision statement and mission statement. Uh, why is that a problem? What's the big deal? So what I'd like to communicate as we enter into this final part of the study, chapters 22 through 26 of the book I wrote, The Coming Kingdom, is theology is a lot like dominoes in a row. If you knock over one domino, what's going to happen to the rest of them? They're obviously going to crumble. And this is what people don't think about when they come up with different theological interpretations. They don't understand that what you do in one area affects another area. So what you do in eschatology, what is eschatology? Study of the end. What you do in eschatology is going to have an effect on ecclesiology. What is ecclesiology? The doctrine of the church. And what you do in ecclesiology is going to have an impact on soteriology. What is soteriology? The doctrine of salvation. So you, you start tampering with eschatology and ecclesiology suffers and so does soteriology. And that's basically what I'm going to try to demonstrate in the final section of this course on the coming kingdom. That's why in the book that I wrote... The title of it is The Coming Kingdom, but the subtitle is What is the Kingdom and How is Kingdom Theology Changing the Focus of the Church? So I didn't just write a book on eschatology just because nobody had ever dealt with this before. I wanted to show that this recycling of Augustine has profound and I mean profound, ecclesiological ramifications. As we have studied, the church has basically three purposes. A, glorify God. And there's all the scriptures that go with it, and we've been through these. A, glorify God. B, edify the saints. And C, fulfill the Great Commission. That's why the church exists. And you can't really uh, succeed in God until you understand why you exist, right? So if your business is struggling and you hire a business consultant to help you with the struggling business, the very first question a consultant will ask if they're worth their salt is why does this business exist? I mean, what is the specific purpose of this business? What, is, is, what need, want, or desire is filled with your product or service that you can't really get anywhere else? And if you can't answer that, you probably have no business being in business. 
And if you can't answer that, there's probably a reason why you're going out of business. And see, what's happening today is you ask your typical Christian, what is the purpose of the church? None of them can give you a straight answer. You ask your typical pastor or even elder or deacon or Sunday school teacher, what is the purpose of the church? None of them can give you a straight answer. So if you can't give, give people a straight answer on that, how do you do church? How do you decide what activities in a church to get involved in and not get involved in? So what's happening with the Southern Baptist Convention, what's happening with a group called the Gospel Coalition, is they're getting involved in all of these kinds of social justice issues, you know, white privilege, structural racism, uh, the, a ministry that was very helpful to me, Campus Crusade for Christ, now called Crew, and they want to get Crusade out of the title, so they changed the title because Crusade is politically incorrect, so let's just call ourselves Crew. Uh, they're getting involved in, and Trevor Loudon, if you go to his Facebook page, he's got all these recordings of their latest, it's either their latest national or regional meetings where all the speakers are getting up and they're talking about white privilege and institutional racism and structural bias and all of these kinds of things. And you're not hearing about the things I used to hear about when I was in Campus Crusade. When I was in Campus Crusade at my college campus in the late 1980s, the mid to late 1980s, the whole emphasis was evangelism. I mean, it was about sharing the gospel with the unsaved. Based on some of the recordings I've been listening to of their latest meetings, it's almost like a social justice rally is what it is. So why, why are these ministries moving into these areas? Because they've gotten away from their purpose. And if you think that we're currently in the kingdom, you get away from this very simple purpose. And you get distracted into all kinds of diversions. Now, wouldn't that be something that Satan pulls on us in the last days? Would Satan do that? Would he distract us from why we exist and get us involved in all sorts of other things that we're not called upon to necessarily uh, focus on? And we spend our waning moments on the earth on the eve of the rapture wasting our time trying to do something in the area of social justice that only Jesus himself can do when he sets up his kingdom. And see, this study is, uh, I hope you're understanding, this is probably one of the most relevant studies you could ever give yourself to. It's very practical. I mean, we've dealt with a lot of exegetical issues and all kinds of things, but I hope you don't lose the practical nature of what it is we've been trying to communicate here. Alva J. McLean wrote a book called The Greatness of the Kingdom in 1959, and I think it's probably one of the greatest books that's ever been written on the kingdom. And this is what he says in his book. I think you, I think you have the quote there. He says, towards the end of the book, theological confusion, especially in matters which have to do with the church, will inevitably produce consequences which are of grave, practical, practical, practical concern. The identification of the kingdom with the church has led historically to ecclesiastical policies and programs even when not positively evil, have been far removed from the original simplicity of the New Testament ecclesia. See how easy our job description is there? Three things. But if you think we are the kingdom, that simplicity gets obscured very, very fast. Uh, do you remember what Paul said concerning the serpent in 2 Corinthians 11? that the serpent was trying to beguile the Corinthians and move them away from the simplicity of Christ. Christianity is not all that complicated. Our doctrine of salvation is not complicated. Our doctrine of the church is not complicated, but Satan always wants to take what's simple and over convolute it 
for the purpose of distraction and corruption. McLean goes on and he says it's easy to claim that in the present kingdom it's easy to, let's see, I lost my train of thought there. Uh, where am I here? Uh, da, da, there it is. It is easy to claim that in the present kingdom of grace that the rule of the saints is wholly exerted only through moral principles and influence. But practically, once the church becomes the kingdom in any realistic theological sense, it is impossible to draw any clear line between principles and their impl implementation through political or social devices. For the logical implications of a present ecclesiastical kingdom, in other words, the practical ramifications of seeing the church is the kingdom are unmistakable and have historically led in one direction political control of the state by the church. That's why everybody today is promoting this kingdom now theology because they want to grasp the reins of political power. He goes on and he says the distances traveled down this road by various religious movements and the forms of control which were developed have been widely different. The difference is very great between the Roman Catholic system and the modern Protestant efforts to control the state. Also between the ecclesiastical rule of Calvin in Geneva Calvin in Geneva and the fanaticism of the of Munster and the English fifth monarchy but the basic assumption is always the same the church in some sense is the kingdom and therefore has a divine right to rule or it is the business of the church to establish fully the kingdom of God among men Thus, watch this now, the church loses its pilgrim character. What, what is the church? The church is a peculiar people that is passing through Satan's domain currently. And we're passing through as pilgrims. Meaning that our home is not here on the earth. Amen? Amen. Does not Paul say, Philippians 3 verse 20, that our citizenship is what? It's in heaven. And we're waiting for the Lord Jesus to come and rescue us from this present evil age. Now the business of establishing the kingdom is something that he's going to do. But if you start to view the present age as the kingdom of God, then the church loses its pilgrim character. And the sharp edge of its divinely commissioned witness is blunted. It becomes an ecclesia, which is not only in the world, but also of the world. It forgets that just as regeneration of the soul could, uh, of the soul only can affect the miracle. Even so, the regeneration of the world can only be brought by the intrusion of the regal power from on high. Matthew 19, verse 28. Now notice he uses the word regeneration. The Greek word is Pauline Genesia, which literally means Pauline, again, a compound word, Genesia, what you recognize the book of the Bible coming from Genesia? Genesis, where we get the word beginning. Regeneration means beginning again. And regeneration, to my mind, my knowledge, is only used two times in the New Testament. Once in relation to personal salvation. Titus 3, verse 5. And once in relationship to the regeneration of the earth. In the millennial kingdom. And what do both instances have in common? They both involve the intervention of Jesus first, and then the regeneration comes. So in salvation, Jesus comes first, then the human soul changes. See that? It's not the other way around. God never says to the human soul, get your act together so that Jesus can come into your life and change you. That's basic soteriology 
And since the same word is used also of the kingdom, Matthew 19, verse 28, it's saying that the regeneration of the world, the regeneration of society, will not take place until what happens first? Jesus comes back to the earth. Just how Jesus has to come into a person's life before they're changed, the same is true with the kingdom. Jesus comes back first at the end of the tribulation period and then he establishes his kingdom. Then you're going to get your social justice and a fix of institutional racism, white privilege, all of these kinds of things people are upset about today. Uh, inequities economically, all that stuff doesn't get fixed until Jesus comes back. So to tell the church you've got to fix society before he comes back is like telling to the lost sinner, get your act together first and then come to Jesus. In both instances, you're telling people to morally reform when they don't have the power to do it. You see that? And that's his point. And because of confusion on this basic issue, what's happened is the church historically has become very confused and gotten into projects that it should have never gotten into. One of which is Calvin's Geneva. He mentions here Calvin's Geneva. You know, we're we're today upset about Sharia law. You know, Sharia law coming to the United States. I mean, Calvin's Geneva was a Christian form of Sharia law where you were not allowed to criticize pastors or you're thrown in jail. Now, part of me thinks maybe we should bring some of that back. No, I'm just kidding. But if you disagreed with Calvin, you were put on trial and you were killed. Sometimes you were tortured. Michael Savitas is one such individual. And you were, you know, essentially, uh, (laughs) your life was illegalized. Church attendance was mandatory. In Calvin's Geneva, which was sort of a Christian form of Sharia law, and why did Calvin go this direction? Because Calvin, although he may have done some good things in other areas, never distinguished between the church and the kingdom. To him, they were one and the same. And so he was taking basically passages that relate to the future kingdom and applying it to his government in Geneva. So where am I going with this? What I'm trying to say is virtually every false doctrine that I can think of that has come into the church that we are now wrestling with in the 21st century has come into the church because of kingdom now theology. And so many times we're shooting at the symptom, but we're not understanding the foundation. If you want to get rid of these false doctrines in Christianity, you've got to deal with the foundation. And the foundation is kingdom now theology. So what I have for us in that in this final section of our study are nine false doctrines that are directly attributable to kingdom now theology. Number one, loss of the church's pilgrim status. Hopefully talk about that tonight. Number two, social gospel. Number three, the church starts to get in bed in terms of ecumenical interfaith alliances with other spiritual groups that don't share our biblical convictions. So ecumenical interfaith alliances, ecumenical interfaith dialogue, all of these things are directly attributable as I'll try to demonstrate to Kingdom Now theology. Number four, a rejection or marginalization of Bible prophecy. I mean, why is it that we keep getting emails from everybody from our website and our Facebook page and YouTube channel and things of that nature where they say, I'm so relieved you guys are teaching Bible prophecy. I can't find a church anywhere that teaches Bible prophecy. My pastor never mentions Bible prophecy. Well, that's attributable to Kingdom Now theology, as I'll show you. Number five, it gets the church building the wrong kingdom. That's how sneaky Satan is. 
The next kingdom on the horizon is not the kingdom of God, but the Antichrist kingdom. Do we understand that? So if the church gets involved in kingdom now theology and kingdom building, they're building the devil's world without even realizing it. Number six, there's a big debate in Christianity about charismatic theology. There are seven uh, disputed sign gifts, apostles, prophets, performers of miracles, uh, those kinds of things, and an awful lot of people are into that kind of thing. That also is attributable to Kingdom Now theology. Number seven, prosperity gospel. If you flip on so-called Christian television, you'll see this taught all over the place by Kenneth Copeland and Kenneth Hagin and Benny Hinn and all of these people, uh, Creflo Dollar, how's that for a name for a prosperity theologian? His last name is Dollar. Uh, Jesse Duplantis, all of these guys are basically saying that God wants you to be rich. You just need to send in a check to my ministry. Notice they never say send it into the orphanage down the street. Send it into my ministry and God is obligated to, to make you rich and he's obligated to take away all of your diseases. Well, how do you explain that in light of the fact that we've had <laughs> one dear saint here at the church that just passed away Several dealing with cancer. Um, obviously that theology is not a reality, but it's attributable, and I'll demonstrate it, to Kingdom Now theology. If you don't have Kingdom Now theology, you don't have prosperity gospel. Number eight, there's a huge movement in Christendom against the nation of Israel. Anti-Israelism. Where there are now and it's stunning to watch, major mainline denominations involved in official boycotts against the nation of Israel. As you probably know, they teach this kind of thing in the schools. It's called the BDS movement, boycott, divestment, and sanctions. It's the view that Israel is somehow an apartheid state and just as we boycotted South Africa to get rid of apartheid, they're trying to make the same argument that Israel is some kind of oppressor. And they're now getting Christians, not just the secular campuses, but Christians involved in the movement. And if you believe that the church has replaced Israel and there is no future for Israel, then who cares about Israel in the Middle East? Let's go ahead and sign up for a Christian form of BDS, also attributable to Kingdom Now theology. And then number nine is Lordship Salvation. Lordship Salvation, as you know, is a corrupt gospel. It mixes faith and works to be justified before God. That doctrine itself, number nine, is also a result of Kingdom Now theology. In other words, Kingdom Now theology provides the soil or the fertile ground from which all of these other things grow up. You see that? And this is why Satan, going all the way back to Augustine, was busy trying to convince the church that the church is the kingdom. If you convince the church that the church is the kingdom, all these other things come into existence and the church remains impotent, powerless, embroiled and encaptured in false doctrine. So what we're gonna do in the final part of the series, and obviously we're not doing all this tonight, this is just sort of an introduction to the, the final section, is to walk through uh, these nine issues. So uh, I've got about 15 minutes left. Let's see if we can tackle at least number one. What is the first theological problem with Kingdom Now theology. Number one, the church, and this was hinted at in the Alva J. McLean quote I gave you earlier. Number one, the church loses its pilgrim status. Lewis Berry Chafer says this, correctly. 
So the church was fully warn, warned from the beginning about the nature of this age and taught concerning her pilgrim character while here and her holy calling and her separateness from the evil age. That's who we are. We're not here to bring in the kingdom. We're awaiting for the Jesus to set up his kingdom. And in the present, we are living in Satan's world. We are ambassadors. And if I'm America's ambassador to China or Iran or wherever, I'm representing American values on foreign soil. That's why Paul, 2 Corinthians 5, around verse 20, calls us ambassadors. We're salt and light in the devil's world. And consequently, we are a peculiar people that really don't fit in with this world. And we're not going to fit in with this world, and we're not going to reign in this world until Jesus comes back and sets everything upright. But in the process, we're passing through this present evil age, and the Bible gives us specific instructions on how to live during this present evil age. Do you, do you all agree with me that this is an evil age? Uh, notice Galatians 1 verse 4 that's why I had you open there 50 minutes ago Galatians 1 verse 4 Paul is very clear that we are living in an evil age who himself who gave himself for our sins that's Jesus that he might rescue us from this what present evil age according to the will of our God and Father. So here I am, here you are, living in the devil's world. And so consequently, what are we called? Notice James chapter 1, verse 1. What are we called? James, James 1, 1, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes who are dispersed abroad. That's who we are. We are the diaspora. We are dispersed abroad, living in the devil's world. Notice 1 Peter 1.1 1, 1 and 1 Peter 2.11. You can follow me along on your own Bible if you want, or you can just relax and look at the screen. Uh, I prefer you follow along in your own Bible, because if you never follow along in your own Bible, you never really learn the books of the Bible. Amen? So that's one of the ways technology has sort of handicapped us uh, we're so used to all these things and I'm as guilty as anybody because I've got all this stuff flashing all around but I am concerned that we're not opening the Bible ourselves you know the old days the pastor would say turn to X and you could hear the whole congregation rattling uh, ruffling their pages and I thought that was a beautiful sound and today we're staring at screens and uh, looking at bulletins and we're really not looking at the Bible. And so try not to let technology usurp basic sword drill, what we used to call sword drill. Because unless you're opening up your Bible and turning to the right part of it, you're never going to learn where different things in the Bible are. Okay, end of, end of uh, rant. Okay. First Peter 1 Peter 1.1, Peter says, to those who reside as aliens, look at that. In fact, the Greek word for aliens, I have it there in parenthesis, is para epidemois, I think is how you say that. Now that's three words made into one word. Para means away in Greek. Epi means one, and in that last part of it that begins with the letter D there in English, transliterated there, demois, do you recognize any English equivalents like domestic, democracy? So that third part of it basically means home. So that word aliens, para epi demois, literally means away from home. That's our identity. We are away from home because our citizenship is where? It's in heaven. That's what's meant by aliens. 
to those who reside as aliens scattered throughout, there's the diaspora again, dispersed, Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, who are chosen. And then if you go over to 1 Peter 2, verse 11, Peter says the exact same thing. He says, Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers. And there's the word again, para epidemois, to abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. So this is our identity. Scattered, dispersed, pilgrims, aliens, away from home. You know, if, so, if, if you call someone today an alien, uh, you're basically saying, well, you're from Mars, you don't even belong here. Or, you know, we have the legal versus illegal immigration debate. If someone has the status alien, it means their actual residency or citizenship is not here in this country, but it's somewhere else. And that's basically our spiritual designation. Absolutely nothing here about us bringing in the kingdom. I mean, if we were in the kingdom, folks, we wouldn't be away from home. So we're mere pilgrims passing through a barren wasteland on the way to a promised land. Hebrews eleven thirteen gives us the same designation. All, it's the hall of faith. All these died in faith. Without receiving the promises, but having seen them and having welcomed them from a distance and having confessed that they were strangers and exiles, there's our same word, on the earth. So who are we? We are strangers and exiles on the earth. And that's why in the Chafer quote, Chafer says, so the church was fully warned from the beginning about the nature of this age. Now, where was the church warned about this? It was warned about this in the upper room discourse. John 13 through 17. Jesus is very clear that he was sending us out into a hostile, evil world controlled by Satan. So the church was fully warned from the beginning about the, the nature of this age and taught concerning her pilgrim character while her while here and her holy calling and separateness from this evil age. So what are we supposed to do living in Satan's world? We're supposed to maintain practical purity. How do you do that? Two ways. Orthodoxy, which means what? Correct belief. And orthopraxy, you recognize the word ortho, right? you gone to the orthodontist and had your jaw or whatever, your mouth corrected, orthocorrect. Orthodoxy, correct belief. Orthopraxy, correct practice. The challenge of the Christian living in the devil's world is to maintain both. Much like a woman spoken for while her fiancé is away, after all, he's the groom, and we're the what? We're the bride, so what is that woman spoken for supposed to do? She is already set aside for him. So she's obviously not to be on all the dating websites and all of these kinds of things. She's a woman spoken for, see that? That's how the church is supposed to be acting. And you act like a woman spoken for when you maintain two things, orthodoxy and orthopraxy and when we stand before the Lord at the Bema seat judgment following the rapture and we're either given rewards or not given rewards it largely has to do with whether we maintained orthodoxy and orthopraxy while living in Satan's world the Bema seat judgment is not a judgment of salvation that issue was already determined the moment we trusted Christ it's a judgment of rewards and when the woman walks down the aisle there's a reason she's in white right she's she it's an outward symbol of her purity and so that's our job that's why we're given all these instructions in the epistles on how to live or to maintain orthodoxy and orthopraxy so we're doing that because we're currently separated from christ he's coming back for us at an unknown time 
So we're pilgrims passing through. Now, if you, if you think the church is the kingdom or the church is establishing the kingdom, then that whole pilgrim mindset is lost. I, I, there's no way I could see myself as a pilgrim in this world if I felt we were in the kingdom. I wouldn't see myself away from home. I would see myself as at home in the world. And look at the church today. Look at all of her buildings and budgets and satellite campuses. Uh, You know, there's a big church in the Dallas area. Uh, We actually used their facilities when I graduated from Dallas Theological Seminary. I mean, the thing to me looks like something that a professional team would play in. They have a McDonald's in there. They have fitness classes, Starbucks, a bowling alley. And, you know, you look around at this monstrosity and you say, well, these really don't look to me like pilgrims that are thinking about leaving. I mean, these to me look like a bunch of people that think they're really at home in the world and they're going to be here for an awful long time. That, what I've been trying to explain, is a manifestation of kingdom now theology. That is a manifestation of the church in its leadership not being clear on the distinction between the kingdom and the church. Well, enough said about that. One other fast thing, I may not even have time to to get to this one. But the second false doctrine that comes into the church is the social gospel. The social gospel is this idea that we're going to bring in kingdom now realities, social justice, economic justice, fixing the ozone layer, the alleged hole in the ozone layer, fixing climate change, universal health care, whatever it is people want to do, we're going to bring in all of these kingdom realities now when the fact of the matter is only Jesus is going to fix those things. I'm not against the church having a a say on this issue or that issue. I think we ought to show up and vote every single election cycle. But you have to understand that the central calling of the church is not to fix the structures of society. That is not a job God gave to the church. And what happens is the great commission, the job he's actually given to the church, becomes the great what? Omission. So you get more and more sermons about racial justice, economic justice, social justice, whatever the cause of the day is. And you get less and less teaching about salvation of souls and individual discipleship, which is the job that Christ actually gave to the church in the devil's world. Social gospel is like handing out water bottles to people as they're on their way to hell, basically what it is. It's humanitarian work. Now, is it wrong to get involved in humanitarian work as a church? It's not necessarily wrong in and of itself, but all of that should be used as a platform to preach the gospel. Because what good does it do to feed someone's stomach for 24 hours if they're never given the gospel and their soul goes into an eternal hell? You know, I just got back from a Bible conference and the particular church I was at, there's just a big rift right now between that church and its young people. Because its young people all want to move in this social justice direction, which is kind of like young people. I mean, I was young once. We want to change the world, right? So we want to drag Christianity into all of these various social causes not really investigating the scripture and trying to figure out what our identity is and what cause is it that God has given us and which causes are there that God has not given us. So we will stay away from things that God never called us to do and we can't have much effect on them anyway. So there's an awful lot of talk today about changing the structures of society. 
structural or institutional cures, and the fancy name for this is called holistic gospel. And you should probably memorize that term because if you're not facing this head on, the young people are getting hit with this all the time. Holistic gospel is the idea that you're changing the collective, watch this now, collective salvation of nations instead of the individual salvation of souls. That's social gospel. Uh, Robert Schuller was one of the first to articulate this about God has a great plan to redeem society. Notice he's talking about the collective salvation of nations and not the individual salvation of souls. That is how the sheep and the goat judgment, Matthew 25, verses 31 through 46, is being mistaught everywhere under the name of social justice. The goal of the church is to collectively change the salvation of nations and the spotlight is being taken off of the individual salvation of souls. That's what we mean by social gospel. So we're going to stop right here, right in the middle of social gospel. So the next time we're together, we'll pick it up here with uh, social gospel. And if folks need to uh, take off, that's great. Pick up your kids, whatnot. Now would be a good time to.